Hello, everyone. We've just uh, let everyone in from the waiting room. So we're going to um, just give us a couple of seconds to make sure everybody's in. They can mute their audio. Uh, yes, please keep your cameras on if you're comfortable with that. And uh, looks like there's just a few more coming in. Uh, we have 29 people on the webinar today with the potential of another 10 or so coming. Um, so it's looking really good. I feel like I should be singing a song right now to entertain everyone. That's a great idea, Susan. <laughs> I'm not sure if my songs are appropriate. <laughs> um, okay, it does look like everyone's coming in. So recognizing that um, the people that have been able to join us today all have very busy days. We're going to get things started fairly quickly. We do have a lot to cover today. Um, so I'll start by welcoming everybody on behalf of BC Plan. My name is Susan Fursell, and I'm the chair of the BC Plan Board and also the director of prior learning assessment and recognition at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. In the chat feature, um, can other people from BC Plan please introduce yourself and the role that you have in BC Plan? I think that'll be a good way to, um, to introduce those others on the call. It looks like there's, there's, there's a handful of us here. I also want to thank uh, both Andrew and Janet uh, Morse Reddy um, for the work they've done in helping to uh, prepare today's webinar and our communications committee, which is a very small and active group. Um, so thank you everyone for the work. We are really excited to um, speak today about the tools and strategies and prior learning assessment. So we're going to start, I'm just going to do a little bit of um, an introduction, including a territorial acknowledgement. And then I'm going to say a few words about the, um, the speakers and the format of the day. And then we're going to give the time to those who um, you've come to listen to. So in the welcome, I just wanted to share, this is a uh, really good webinar for us in terms of we've got a really wide diversity of people, not just from British Columbia, but from across Canada and even around the world. Uh, so we have people on the call from, from France, uh, from Australia, from Kenya, uh, and I might have missed a few. Um, so anyways, it, we're, we're in really good company today. And I think it goes to show the interest in prior learning and um, the tools and the strategies among many other topics. Today, I am very honored to be working on the traditional lands of the Tkamloops de Shwepnik, and where we are privileged to live, work, learn and play. I invite you in the chat feature to acknowledge the land that you are privileged to live, work, learn, and play on, and also to introduce yourself, um, of course, um, who you're working with and maybe what's interesting you in this session today. As we come together, um, I'm reminded by Shwepnik wording, and I'm gonna try to pronounce it, Pawakik Kwesnas Nows which means um, coming together to help one another. And I feel that's what we're doing today. We, we're coming to hear some really important information for people to share what's working well for them and the learners that they're working with. And just before I hand everything over to the speakers, I wanna say a few words about BC Plan because I recognize there's a number of people on this webinar that maybe don't know anything or, or aren't familiar with BC Plan. We are a network of organizations and individuals who have come from across the province to promote increased access to post-secondary credentials and skilled employment through informed recognition of the skills and knowledge adults bring to post-secondary education, business and industries. Our mission is to provide a communication network and learning community uh, to organize and implement educational and professional development opportunities such as this one today and ones we've done in the past and the future. We encourage and support innovative partnerships to facilitate increased access, and I think that's really the important piece, increased access to credentials and lifelong um, employment success for adults in BC. 
And as you can tell, we support collaborative approaches to recognition of learning solutions. And I welcome you or encourage you to visit us um, on our website, bcplan.ca. Uh, visit us on Facebook or Instagram, or um, even our Twitter um, feed, which is at bcplan1. And maybe Andrew, you can pop that into the chat feature. Um, I shared that because Andrew has done an excellent job at curating different information, whether it's articles, news, um, bits and pieces that I find as a career as a PAR practitioner is really valuable to me. So whenever I see his tweets pop up, it's always quite good to click on them and see. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our two guest speakers, and then I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the format. So our first guest speaker is uh, Dr. Diane Conrad, um, an, an online learning consultant, and she's going to be speaking today about elements of prior learning assessment. Those of you who have been on our website um, have probably read her bio, but I went through it and I wanted to find a few key pieces um, because I've always admired her work and um, I'm thrilled that we get to have her speak today. Diane is a longtime adult and distance education a distance educator who specializes in PLAR, online assessment and open learning. And that, those, that combination in itself is pretty impressive. She's published uh, widely in academic journals and continues to review journal articles and sits on many editorial boards. She is now retired and um, continues to teach online, consult and write. So definitely, um, uh, yeah, absolutely some targets for many of us on this call. She has published two books I recommend um, you take a look at if you haven't already. One is Assessment Strategies for Online Learning, Engagement and Authenticity. And the second book is Opening, Education, Theory and Practice, which she co-edited with Dr. Paul Prinslow. So Diane's gonna speak first, and then Julie Eve O'Meara from Banyay College is gonna speak about authentic assessment and tools for PLAR. And um, as soon as I saw your name, Julie Eve, I've been such a fan of what Quebec's doing for prior learning assessment. And I thought, oh, I, I get to listen to what she has to say. So Julie Eve is a ground root presenter and has um, been working in PLAR for what, eight years now, since 2013 as an RAC, which is Recognition of Acquired Competencies Advisor with um, the Continuing Education Departments in various colleges in Quebec. She has a long career in program development, implementation and evaluation within education and vocational fields. And um, this, this resonated with me, Julie Eve, that your passion for PLAR began when you were an employment counselor and you quickly saw that gap between qualified workers arriving from abroad and their inaccessibility to enter the, the workforce in, um, due to the lack of the validation of learning. Uh, I have a very similar path and um, Janet Morris Reddy and a number of other career practitioners on the call, um, this will echo with them. So just a quick few words about the format, then we're gonna start with Diana. Um, Diane, my sister's name is Diana. <laughs> Um, both women have uh, taken a lot of time to um, develop presentations for today and have been gener generous enough to share with us um, PowerPoints. Um, we're going to start with uh, Diane and move on to uh, Julie Eve, moving from the general to the specific. We're going to take the entire 90 minutes. Um, if you need to leave, uh, thank you for coming today. And, um, but we really hope you can stay for the entire entity of the session. Um, there will be room for questions and answers. Uh, Janet, Andrew, and myself are going to moderate that somewhat. And if it seems appropriate to break into the presentation and ask a question, we'll do so. And we'll um, also save some questions for the end of the presentation. I recognize uh, 90 minutes isn't a lot to put into this time that everything we want to put into it. So we're going to try to respect your time and the presenters' times and, and keep it coordinated that way. So if you would type your questions into the chat room, we'll be watching for those and administering um, as best we can. And just because I know some of you have this question, will you be able to get the presentation PowerPoints and the link to the webinar? The link to the webinar, yes, absolutely. And Julie and Diane, yes, to the PowerPoint as well, right? Okay. 
So that's, that's it from me. We're gonna start now with Dr. Diane Conrad and she's gonna be speaking about elements of prior learning assessment. Over to you, Diane. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for those um, introductory words. It's lovely to be here and I am um, delighted that BC Plan had me back again because I presented um, very many years ago in uh, in person actually at that time now i've lost my screen and there it is okay let's get it back here and make it big i can't really see it very well why is that okay andrew i think i did something on my end and i'm not quite sure what it is because at any rate, well, how is okay. it right now? Um, try that again, please. That last um, little thing you did. Hmm. For some reason, it does not want to be as big as it should be. Uh, wait a minute. We might be doing something else here. Okay. Well, we'll just we'll just plow on, because you know we're all experienced in this technology. So again, thanks. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, what I didn't include is something very important to me. I am retired, yes. And uh, I have three grandsons, uh, aging and rage from, uh, raging in age from 18 to seven months. And I just met the seven month old uh, a couple of weeks ago at my younger son's wedding. Uh, the seven month old is in Texas. Of course, I couldn't go there to see him, but now I've seen him. So that is wonderful for me. Um, I also noticed on the uh, list of participants that was flashing up a few moments ago that there are some of my very old friends on board today. Uh, it is so uh, lovely. I'm thrilled to see you, Don, Mary, Greg, Judy. Wow, this is this is really nice. Um, and overall, you know, if you can't get your question answered, my email will be at the end of the presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions that come directly to me via email. I'm going to go at this from uh, macro to micro from the big picture to uh, the um, more the strategic and the tools. The reason that I am going to uh, focus on the big picture is because a lot of people don't um, don't address the big picture and that is important for me to do because it just is a very, very critical uh, part of running a good PLAR practice. Okay, uh, let's move to the first screen, Andrew, please. Okay, I don't use a picture when I zoom or do anything ever because it distracts me, but here, here is me. Uh, here is me um, in various uh, places and poses and uh yeah that's that's it and you saw my most recent picture of me on the bio which is a hugely frivolous picture in a hat with a lot of nice apple blossoms around it but a great picture i really like it next please andrew okay let's start again macro let's go back historically to to get a good foundation on what we're doing here with a prior learning assessment and recognition, which goes by a number of names, including the new one that Julie mentioned, RAC, and I have a list of some other names at the end of the presentation. So I don't need to read this to you, but there it is, uh, what John Dewey said in 1938, where he was sort of set the, the, the modern stage for our practice of, uh, of PLAR. Next, please, Andrew. So to have... Um, the successful implementation of PLAR, you need a number of things. This is my first macro concept. I've divided the presentation to macro concepts and micro concepts, again, moving from the general to the specific. So um, that's, that's the format I'm going to take. Now, can everybody hear me okay? Am I loud enough? Will somebody, will somebody tell me yes? Shake your yes. head. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So praxis, the marriage of theory and practice, that's important. So we're going to look at some theory. 
whatever we do in the line of PLAR has to be sorted by institutional policy. And that's a huge issue. There's not a great number of PLAR practitioners or PLAR operations at university level across Canada, much more so at, uh, thank you, Andrew, much more so at uh, college level and Quebec has always been a, a, um, a solid practitioner. And the third part of the macro concept is that PLAR needs to be championed by knowledgeable practitioners. A champion is always needed. This, uh, the energy that, that comes from someone who strongly believes in this process, I have found over my years as a practitioner to be incredibly uh, essential because there's a lot of pushback to PLAR. Now I'm getting into the next slide, Andrew, please. I look at macro concept number two, I'm sorry, one, um, and it's the big stage of PLAR, and that's politics and process. So we've got the internal players and the external stakeholders. We could, we could um, change those words around and say internal stakeholders, external players, whatever, but I thought it worked better this way. Internally, and by internal, I mean internal to your institution or your organization, we've got the administrators, the academics, the learners themselves, I considered them internal to the process, and externally, we've got the employers and other institutions. Employers who are going to look at their potential employees' uh, records and see what's there. Do they accept PLAR? Um, do they not accept it? And, you know, the jury's always out on that. And other institutions, same thing. You might be a student who wants to transfer your uh, PLAR acquired or earned credit to another institution who may not accept that. When I was working uh, in the field at Athabasca University with uh, their um, quite well-developed system, that issue of transferability and acceptance by other institutions was always an issue. And I should add at this point that my focus here and, and my uh, the primary amount of my experience comes from my years at Athabasca University. So the next slide, please, Andrew. Okay. So internally, macro concept number two, we've got marrying and mudding theory and practice, because these things are the things that are happening. With the theory and practice are both being married, but at the same time being muddied. And those of you who are in the field, which probably most of you, I think, uh, are aware of, of this tension, of this conflict that goes on. So. A strong philosophical foundation to understand what exactly PLAR is doing demands uh, a, a level of academic prowess. And I've written a lot about this in the past few years. That academic prowess needs to have integrity. It needs to be exercised rigorously. And of course, the expertise. There is so much to know has been already acknowledged. And uh, I hope I can get through a lot of it in, in this time period. Varying belief systems are going to lead to varying interpretations of any system. And in this case, the system is PLAR. So we're going to see people who have different beliefs. And um, I know Judy Harris wrote a really good article some years ago about different ways that knowledge can be understood. And uh, certainly this is one of the prime issues foundationally of, um, of the PLAR process. What is knowledge? How do we understand it? Who owns it? The whole epistemological uh, landscape is at play here. And so we also have, as I mentioned earlier, the pushback, the resistance, and the controversy. When I arrived at Athabasca University, I was thrust into the immediate conflict of the people who wanted to see PLAR grow and flourish and the people who did not believe it at all. I arrived there in the fall and I was slated to do a institution-wide forum in November. I, that was just thrown at me. So I had two months to try and do some field work and groundwork and, and, and produce some documents and get some stuff together so that I could speak in front of everybody and bring them on board this process, which I was hired to um, expand and, and market and deliver. 
And um, I suppose by the end of uh, eight years there, we had achieved that uh, to, to a satisfactory degree. There were some people who never bought into it in spite of a wonderful system that was university-wide and supported by, by policy, which of course was very essential. Next slide, slide please, Andrew. So externally, uh, we have to please the populace. Uh, we have to please the employers, as I mentioned, and the other institutions. They have to be okay with this process that we are doing that not everybody accepts. Next. Okay, here's the third macro concept. PLAR is about learning. And this is where a foundational belief uh, a solid foundational belief comes into play because we need to understand the learning, the pedagogy that undergirds the processes that we are enacting. So the notion of learning is one of the um, tension issues that separates PLAR from transfer credit or credit evaluation. We are not evaluating the learning that someone else has, um, the, that a learner has gained elsewhere, which is what transfer credit does essentially, and also credit evaluation. We are evaluating and assessing the learning that is occurring through the student working on a PLAR application document portfolio. We'll talk more about those strategies later on. So the process of PLAR, as I'm going to explain it, and as I practiced it, allows learners to build knowledge from their prior learning gain from experience, hence Dewey's experiential learning. It's important to differentiate here that the learning is gained from experience. So we're not assessing the experience. Rather, we're assessing the learner learning that arrived from that experience. This is sort of akin to handing out a certificate of whatever call you want to call it, completion, participation, attendance, after a day large seminar where you may or may not have slept through it. I've been in that situation, and I know probably you guys have too. So uh, we're not just going to rubber stamp anything. We're going to see the demonstration and articulation of learned knowledge in our PLAR process. Bringing prior learning forward requires both reflection on the part of the applicant and creativity. It also requires critical thinking. I didn't want to delve too much into that type of pedagogy uh, and epistemology because I know I don't have time to really flesh it out, but I will give resources at the end of the presentation. Next, please, Andrew. Okay, so PLAR is about deconstructing the experiential learning by servicing the tacit learning that we all have. Now, tacit learning is, is obviously tacit. It's not surfaced. So I use this example, getting ready for bed, and you can look at the getting ready for bed uh, document at the website that I've indicated on the screen, and that is on Athabasca University's website, which I'm, I'm glad to see is essentially the same as when I retired from that office eight years ago, uh, when we developed all, all these tools and strategies. Getting ready for bed, you'll see by the diagram, which I couldn't get on the screen, um, we all go to bed. And we do some things before we go to bed. We, we generally, I, I'm speaking, I think generally, we wash our face, we brush our teeth, um, and, and we change into our bed clothes, perhaps. But there's a whole other set of things that are tacit that we don't actually do, but, but we know, and that knowledge is, is um, not really surfaced. Like for some people, bedtime involves a spiritual um, uh, process of either, of some way. We know we have a number of um, religions and uh, ethnicities and beliefs represented on this session. So I'm not gonna go into it any further than that. But when you go to this, if, if you go to this website, you'll see a list of some of the tacit understandings that people don't think of when they think of going to bed, you know, maybe like securing the house. 
you know, making sure the dog or the cat is okay and, and doing whatever dogs and cats uh, do at night. So this is um, an illustration of how we surface the tacit learning that our applicants have when usually or often they do not realize that they could, that they have that knowledge. So this is the essence of the of the process. Next slide, please, Andrew. So it's we build new knowledge. We're not crediting that already completed formal learning from from elsewhere. Uh, okay. We bring forward. I've repeated some of the issues here that involve learning. We bring forward that prior learning um, re that requires both reflection, creativity, and we do this with a certain number of re resources that will vary across practices and with tools. And I mentioned Bloom Taxonomy, which I'll, I'll uh, review in a moment, and usually mentoring and coaching. In our practice, the mentoring and coaching was extremely important. And I had a couple of lovely, lovely ladies working with me who coached the learners through this process. It was not an easy process or a fast process, either for learner or for um, the mentors, but we felt it was essential so that the learners could learn how to articulate their learning inappropriate university terms. Now, this is a contentious issue in the uh, literature about prior learning. If we ask the learners to couch their learning in university terms, for example, or rather university language, academic language, are we honoring the learners learning appropriately, or are we trying to shove them into an academically created um, box, if you will, a language that they're not familiar with. So there's a lot of argument on both sides of this. And again, it's been written about um, fairly, fairly um, well, and substantially in the literature. Okay, next slide, please, Andrew. Okay, so let's look at the first micro concept, which is process, process and product. It's hard to separate these two, so I, I didn't agonize about doing that. But let's say that we assume a conducive internal environment. That means hopefully we've got a discrete PLAR unit that can work across the institution and is separate from any influencing programs or units or anybody who might want to be a part of the process who should not be, if I dare say, a part of the process. So these folks who work in a discrete PLAR unit or whatever it might be called at your institution should be appropriately trained and knowledgeable. They also need um, uh, they need, okay, I'll talk about that later. Institutional policy support is important. And so the who includes administrators who need to understand what you're doing. And then again, across the university, because it's really not fair to learners if one area of your institution or your college practices and accepts PLAR as a means of gaining credit and another doesn't. And if you have appropriate institutional support, the policy should embrace the entire institution. Now, an important um, thing as far as your process goes is to have academic and administrative integration. That is, the programs have to work with the PLAR uh, unit or department. The registrar has to understand what's happening when the uh, documentation for awarding credit comes in from the PLAR people. And the assessors, of course, are a vital part of this mix. Now, there was just a question from Susan about whether other instruments are being used besides Bloom's taxonomy which is the one that we use and it's as you know bloom's taxonomy very uh, well respected and recently well not so recently actually 2001 we 
revised by Crethwell and Anderson from the original um, taxonomy for, of 1956. So we just used it and found it worked very, very well. And I think I'll say about more about it later. So next slide, please, Andrew. Thank you. This is uh, as much of the flow chart that I could get on the slide, no matter what I did. So you can see this flow chart under PLAR process on the Athabasca University website. We developed it there and it's sort of the top half. And it starts with the learners, of course. And, and, and here's how they can enter our system. They can consult uh, with us, which we like because then we can give them the direct information. They can go to our website. They can get a referral from other AU centers. Now, when I talked earlier about integration and pan-university reach, we had to specifically educate the information attendants at Athabasca, which, as you know, is a distance institution, so our infrastructure is very heavy with people uh, answering phones, and we had to uh, instruct and train those, those ladies, mostly, in how to respond to questions about PLAR. And so they could sort of answer baseline questions and or refer folks to us, which of course we preferred. So once the, fo the, the applicants get into our system, then we enter the block in the middle, which is called uh, mentorship. And that includes a lot of consulting, communicating, revising, you know, the whole thing when you're working in an interactive, communicative way on, on a project. And, and down it goes. And there's more things at the bottom. But again, you can look at that if you choose. Uh, it is on the web website in its completion. Also, you'll see to the left three arrows. And those are other agencies that, in, that we reach out to or input to our process as we go along. I'm speaking in the present tense, but of course this is all past tense for me. Next slide, please, Andrew. Here's the taxonomy, and I'm, I'm confident that most of you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, and you can't read the small print on here, but there's many, many similar illustrations on the internet that you can take a look at if you want to. And basically this is, um, a pyramid structure of knowledge, starting with what is considered the baseline knowledge, which is simply remember something, move to understand it, which used to be called uh, comprehension, I think, and then application of that concept, the ability to analyze that concept, evaluate it, and finally create something new out of the, the concept or the knowledge that you're working with. The top uh, level of, of creativity used to be called synthesis. So you can see there's just a small difference between synthesizing your ideas, pulling them together into a comprehensive whole, and then actually creating the next step with the synthesis that you've done. So this was the change that Grathwell and Anderson enacted in 2001. Uh, okay, Hannah at SAIT has posted the flowchart. Thank you very much, Hannah. So next slide, Andrew. What is an airport, a new, oh my goodness, uh, an e-portfolio, microconcept three. And again, this is, this is now product. We used an e-portfolio. I'll be interested to hear from Julie if an e-portfolio is used in their system. We found it was certainly the best way to do all the things that this slide says it can do. There's a number of types of e-portfolio that many populations use. There's the portfolio that you bring to, for your performance review. If you're an artist, you walk around with a big leather case, a portfolio of all your works, and so on and so forth. Generally, we consider an e-portfolio a learning portfolio. Okay, so next slide, please, Andrew. So what's in the e-portfolio? Well, our e-portfolio, which is you know really the only one I can speak about, is it contains a short introductory bio, um, what we call learning statements, 
and um, documentation, which include a number of different things. I mentioned the letters of attestation, which are important, and also a proof of a product. If a person says, for example, that they've written a book and it got good reviews, well, we'd like to see the reviews. We might even want to see uh, some parts of, of the book. And it's easy for a learner to bring forth in a portfolio um, examples or the articulation of, of products that they have produced. The short introductory bio is interesting and we have to guide students a lot on this because it just gives them a chance to tell their life story. And there's something very um, compelling and uh, emotional about telling one's life story in a learning context, especially if there's a trauma in the background, some, some difficulty, which there well may be uh, for these folks who are coming to ask us to affirm the learning that they've had in what is often a very long career without a formal credential. So there's a lot tied up here. There's a lot at stake. High stakes is what we call this. However, some folks I've seen over the years really want to delve into their personal trauma and things that have happened to them that have interrupted their learning or disrupted their lives. And we have to coach them that this isn't the place for that. We want to know about your learning and how your learning proceeded through the year. So we have a lot of tools. All these tools, mind you, are once again mounted for your viewing on the Athabasca University PLART website, if you care to look at them. I'm reading what Don has said. Hi, Don. Um, okay, targeted evidence package. Okay, thanks for that. Um, documentation, again, the letters of attestation generally put those letters of attestation come from someone who is in a position to make a statement about the quality of your learning. That's the best way to put it. So not your mother and not your sister, uh, unless they're very special circumstances. And that's another issue that we've had with learners over the years. No, we can't take a letter from your husband um, attesting to anything. Um, it has to be from, you know, somebody else who is sitting in a good position to understand the, the validity of what you've said. And we also supply a template from, uh, for, for doing this well. This is very hard for some learners and sometimes they run into barriers where they have to go back and ask uh, uh, someone that they've already left the employment of or there's been a bad relationship. So we, we deal with all these situations in a variety of ways. Next slide, please, Andrew. Okay, this is what a learning a statement is, and this is a very precise format that we used. I can't speak to whether anybody else used this, but this is the way we felt that knowledge had to be demonstrated at the level we wanted to demonstrate it. I should mention here that we allowed prior learning assessment credit right up to fourth year of the university. Some institutions restrict it to certain Courses. Some institutions restrict PLAR to, to, to um, the first two years of, um, of a degree, but we allowed it to range from right up to the fourth level, highest level uh, senior courses. Naturally, if that was the credit that was going to be awarded, we wanted the learning to be pegged at the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. That's a really big concept. In other words, if you're looking for fourth level um, senior year learning, we want the learning that you demonstrate to be at that level, which means not just remembering and not just understanding it, but right up to the top of the taxonomy, which is why this worked so well for us. So. That's what a learning statement is, and they are uh, the applicants are writing in response to outcomes. So that's another part of the tool structure. We supply learning outcomes, and the learner looks at those and says, yeah, I know that stuff. I can do that stuff. And then the process is to match up their particular learning with the outcomes that are desired. Now, again, there might be criticism of the system in that we're slotting learners in to something that doesn't fit them so well. A part of the mentor's job is to help them make that fit. And by and large, it's quite, it's quite possible. And 
within the university, and I'm of two minds here because I certainly understand the value of PLAR and, and the value of experiential knowledge, but the university and probably colleges as well are not going to give credit that somehow doesn't relate to their business of, of learning and what they purport to present and should be contained within a degree. So, so you've, you've got two sides to this tension and um, it, it's a line that has to be uh, trod all the time. Next, please, Andrew. Here's an example of a learning statement. This is, this is all one learning statement and it's a very real one. I took it from old data uh, stored in the deep recesses of my computer. And uh, it's, as you can see, very technical from a learner who was involved in these very technical things that I really know nothing about. But um, this learner was able to substantiate his or her ability to do these things in the way that we talked about documentation, either by um, enclosing a product that uh, he or she had developed or a letter of attestation for someone who supervised them as they did this thing. Now, here's one learning statement example. And to satisfy the requirements of one learning outcome, there might have been three or four of these, uh, of these learning statements to attend to the learning that the learner feels is valuable in order for him or her to receive credit for this particular type of knowledge. Next slide, please, Andrew, another example. Here's a learning statement of a different type. You can see that it's, it's obviously for a different uh, type of course, different outcomes. And um, bye, Don, nice talking to you. Um, different outcomes and um, it's about communication. So we could say it's softer. And, you know, if you're going to talk about a difference between hard sciences and soft sciences, yes, it's a bit softer, but it's very important in the area of, of communications. And again, the writer would have to supply uh, some type of evidence that in fact, this was true. And, and that's, that's not too hard to come by. And we look for that. And if it's not there, we'll go back and, and try and find a place where we can find that documentation. Next slide, please. Okay, micro concept four, I believe this is the last micro concept. We're moving into some of the detail. Assessing PLAR, which is the a whole assessment uh, kit and caboodle was at the bottom of that flow chart. It was not included on what I showed you because I couldn't squeeze it in. But assessors are key to the process. I've often said to assessors that they are the heart of the process and they must fulfill all these conditions. First of all, they've got to understand the spirit of PLAR. That's your first hurdle is to find people who get what we're doing. They have to accept the value of experiential learning and not be curriculum bound. That is like content in a box. I can't speak for any of you, but in my life at the university and not just this one university, uh, so many profs think that their content is the only content, that their book is the only book, and that whatever a student learns in a certain area has to come from, thank you, Julie, yes, very important concept. And this is where the push and shove comes with some of these academics and dare say, uh, this is a very traditional view from the sage uh, on the stage, kind of positivist approach to learning, not a constructivist approach to learning, uh, not encouraging critical thinking, collaboration, just uh, here's what I say, here's the book I wrote, read it, and you'll know everything there is to know. So your PLAR assessors cannot, cannot be of that mind because that's just not going to work. And they have to be super well versed in their content area uh, because what we're doing here, what the learners are doing here, is they're bringing in knowledge that might not be contained in a, in a course, but it's still relevant. It's over there rather than, let's say, over here, but it's still relevant. And so the um, assessors have to be open to that by knowing what content is, is potentially out there. As they work through the portfolio, they have to provide meaningful 
qualitative feedback. There is a quantitative side to this too, which I'm not going to get into because that's a whole process of, you know, adding up the credits and, and, and everything. But the qualitative feedback is what helps folks know what they've done well and what they haven't done well. That's especially important if they don't succeed in getting the credit. By the way, our success rate was 86%. In other words, 86% of uh, the credit that was asked for was achieved. And they need to work independently of each other with integrity. In other words, they, they're not these portfolios where students put them together and submit this picture of their, of their, their personal life and, and their learning life and things that are meaningful to them. It's not for sharing with other people. And whereas we assign a team of assessors, usually three, um, we ask them to work independently of each other and of anybody else. So you don't want your program chair coming in and looking over your shoulder and saying, oh, I don't think that's any good. Uh, we don't teach that or anything like that. That's why I emphasized at the beginning the independence of this work from anybody else except those who are charged with this task. Next slide, please, Andrew. So. Plur outcomes, there are many, and I think that was that was uh, addressed a little bit in, in Susan's opening remarks. Obviously, the awarding of credit towards learners programs, and usually there's a maximum allowed, and this maximum varies across processes and between institutions. We had a maximum of 60 credits permissible in one program, but our usual maximum was 30. In some of what I would call the hardcore cases, they might only allow six, which is, you know, pretty puny. Um, but that's the way it is. So a part of my job as the director of this process was to go out and, and, and bend arms and bend ears trying to, uh, to get folks to, um, you know, get on board a little better. Students save money. That's really big. In our institution, they saved quite a bit of money. Again, this varies across systems. But as important as anything else, learners benefit from an increased sense of self-esteem because they've explored this learning that they have. They didn't know they had it. All of a sudden, they've been able to reach into their learning with that, uncover that tacit learning, and they're getting credit for it. They're being recognized by the university. So this heightens their sense of the value of that learning, and they can actually name it, which in most cases, that learning has never been named. Okay, next slide, please. Now, I'm on resources here and I'm not gonna walk you through this. I think there's five pages of, res of resources and they're all there. Uh, you see some of the names I've mentioned, um, mentioned again. And I think most of them are available online. Anyway, lots of good stuff in there. A lot of theoretical stuff, a lot of foundational material that I mentioned, the tools and the explanation and examples, many, many examples of tools are on the Athabasca University website. Now here's the last word that uh, there are a lot of names by which uh, prior learning and recognition is called. And uh, I've just listed some of them here. There are others. There's one that I think is Vail, and it's from Europe and perhaps France, and I couldn't find it, and I can't remember what it stands for. But these all basically mean, mean the same thing. And Julie mentioned RAC earlier, too. So there's probably many more. But don't be confused if you see these used synonymously or, or here and there. When I'm writing about PLAR, I actually don't know what to use. I tend to use. Um, RPL, and then if I'm writing um, for an American audience, I'd probably use PLA because they, they use that a lot. So I think that's all I have to say. I hope I did okay with the timing. There is my email. If you have any direct questions uh, that you want to ask, I will be very, very happy to answer them. Okay. So back to you, our moderator, Andrew, thank you for your help. Thank you so much for that information and um, sharing the, you know, there's a lot of richness in the information you shared. Uh, the resources, I'm, I'm quite um, interested to, you know, look up at, 
look those up. So thank you so much for that information and for taking the time, Diane, to, to share your expertise and that oversight of your experience with PLAR. And I see Andrew just put in the chat group um, your, your email, so just a little bit easier to access that way. Um, so, so does Andrew, I'm looking at you for time. Um, do we have time for a question or two or should we move um, wait to Julie E for the next presentation? Oh, you're on mute, Andrew. Yeah. I suggest adding questions to the chat and then if we have questions uh, time, we can uh, touch on them. And we can also get back uh, by email to the questions. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so then um, it's with great excitement that I introduce um, Julie Eve again. She's going to speak about a theft, uh, <laughs> Authentic assessment and tools for PLAR. I'm going to turn off my camera and mute my mic now. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Everybody can hear me okay? Great. Um, and everybody can see my screen. We're good. Let me just make sure that I can see my screen over here. Oh. Not yet, Julie. It hasn't come up yet. It hasn't yet? Oh. Now? Nope. Aha, maybe if I press the share button, it would help. There you go. Oh yeah, it's good. <laughs> All right. So it is, um, I have to say quite an honor to go um, after the, um, Dr. Conrad because I did my thesis uh, on Flar and obviously read many of her articles. So it was very exciting to have a live uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that I am located uh, on unceded uh, Indigenous lands uh, in Montreal, uh, known as Ganagahe, um, and it's the nation of the Mohawks. So uh, yes, I am in Quebec. And in Quebec, as some of you already know, uh, we do a lot of what we call RAC, uh, Recognition of Acquired Competencies, which you can see on the slide. Uh, and the government uh, funds programs, trainings. Uh, we have a very a harmonious approach uh, to make sure that all of the colleges, because we do it at the community college level, the CJEPs is what we call them, we are 46 CGEPs in Quebec, technical colleges that offer uh, many types of services for PLAR. And so we work together and we have a center of expertise that shares a lot of the knowledge and helps guides us and make sure that we're helping, uh, we call them candidates in our, in our case, uh, get through our services. Now, you're gonna hear similar concepts that uh, Diane spoke about there's definitely, um, it's gonna be packaged maybe differently or the terminology won't be the same, right? Uh, coming from a bit of a French setting, a French background, we had to use things that were easier to be tra translated. Uh, so if ever you're not sure what I'm talking about uh, in, in your terms, put it into the chat and I will do my best to catch it and mention it right away. Um, okay, let me just see. I'm gonna open the chat up so I can see it as well. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so here we go. Um, come back. So today, I mean, uh, brief, right? Uh, we've got limited time. I could talk about PLAR for hours. Uh, as known in the introduction, I'm extremely passionate about it. I think it's something that's so, detrimentally important. Uh, it's a right that individuals have. I've worked a lot with immigrants and immigrants who come here should have, they are knowledgeable and we, we shouldn't have to force them to retake stuff they don't know. So it's very important uh, for me. Um, I'm not, I can't see everybody because I have two screens and I don't, uh, somebody keeps trying to call me. Uh, I know some of your teachers in the room, I, ma mainly higher education, I think I understood. Uh, we call practitioners in Quebec content experts. So you, you know, you're an assessor or an evaluator, you are known as a content expert. Some of you might be both. Um, 
And I want you all to be an A participant um, because I'm going to talk about how assessments are uh, need to be appropriate, uh, authentic, loves that word, authentic assessments. It's hard to say, say if you say it three times in a row, authentic assessment, it might get complex. Um, we have to remember we are in an academic setting, right? Diane spoke about the fact that we are doing this for credit. So there are uh, our institutional policies that we do kind of have to follow under, fall under. Um, and I speak a lot with the competency-based model. So I will use the word competency quite a bit. You'll hear me say it a lot. Interesting. Okay. So very first thing when you're creating assessments in or developing assessments or uh, in FLAR is these are the three key words that in our case, in our province, we have to abide by. Um, if you want your assessments to be credible, right? Like what uh, Diane was saying, we don't want to uh, think that it's an easy way to get credit. We don't want, we want to demystify that kind of information. Uh, it's not a crackerjack uh, diploma that we're handing out. So we need our assessments to be rigorous, okay? Um, and how do we do that? Well, we do it by making sure that they have validity, reliability, and feasibility, okay? So I'm gonna break this down because those kind of words are kind of heavy theoretically, but let's take them down one by one. So validity, what does that mean? It means that the tool or the instrument, so we're talking about either the evaluation or, or what it is that you're gonna to do to assess, uh, needs to be adequately chosen to measure that competency. So you, you need to choose the right way to do the assessment. And an example, a very plain example would be, if I'm gonna cut an apple, well, I'm gonna go for a knife, not a fork. The right tool would be a knife, not a fork. So you need your tool to be valid for what you're about to measure, okay? So that's the first, and it's common, right? In research, uh, I know there's lots of researchers in the room. Uh, this is, you know, when you're gonna use testing or examining, you need to have the correct measure and validity to, to be valid. Uh, is an important uh, to carry your claims, right? The next point, the reliability piece is that your tool or your instrument has to be consistent, right? If you're gonna use it again over and over to assess individuals, well, it needs to come out the same each time. I'm not talking about the result itself, but it needs to be uh, that you're gonna, you, you can rely on it. This is gonna work every time, right? So back to my, a uh, dull example of cutting an apple. Well, if I'm gonna cut an apple with a knife, I expect that it, that knife is gonna cut my apple every time. There shouldn't ever be a problem with that. I can rely on my knife, right? So you should be able to make sure that the tools you use are um, consistent, super important word. The third piece, feasibility, <laughs> feasibility. Um, is to make sure that it's it's doable. Is this is this like is it can we achieve this? Is this the right thing? Like, is it realistic? Can the tool that I selected to assess my individual is it going to work? Basically, um, so coming back to the knife, uh, does it make sense uh, that I use a butter knife? Is that going to work? Is it feasible? Will the knife be able to cut my apple? We're not sure. Um, you know, so you want to make sure that in your development stages of creating assessments, that you're looking at these three important must-haves. Okay, that's the beginning. Here we go. We're continuing. Is everything clear? We're good? Wonderful. So a couple of important reminders, um, and there's three of them here, and I'm going to break them down a bit more. Diane spoke about this a little bit. So this is your assessment, your evaluation is related to a job task, right? Like we were saying, it's, it's PLAR is because they have experience. They're not coming back to school. They are mainly uh, already have the skills, the knowledge and the learning, they have it. And normally it's because they're probably working in a field. Sometimes it could be that they learned it through extracurricular activities, but oftentimes, when you're going to evaluate somebody to give them credit for a certificate or a diploma or a program or however you call it where you are, 
Well, you need to know that you're assessing them on something they're doing already. They do this. I'll talk a bit more about it later. Another important reminder, it's an individualized approach, right? It's, um, it's not uh, a group testing. It's not, so we're gonna talk a bit more about that. And one slide doesn't fit all. Okay, let's break down the first point, which is the assessment is related to a job task. So if we're talking about competency-based evaluations, where in learning we are talking about competencies, what is a comp what does that mean? What is a competency? I mean, I know a lot of you already know this, but it's an important reminder that a competency is defined by a combination of abilities and skills and knowledge to do something, to be able to accomplish something, right? An end result. Um, so, and that's what you're evaluating. You're evaluating the competency, you're not evaluating the, the where, the what, like how did she learn this or how come she has, she, you're just learning the what. And in PLARA, what we do is we verify, is that person competent? Can they do it? Can they do it? Yes or no? The end result. Um, I always like making a, a little sidebar here is, in my case in Quebec, uh, PLARA falls underneath the educational system uh, ministry, if we can say. And if you think of the workforce and you think of somebody that's competent, you say, well, yes or no, they're competent. But then if you're assessing someone in the educational system, you have to put a grade on it. Um, you might be using a rubric or an evaluation scale because it is tied to academic credits. And therefore, you're not just saying yes or no, they can be competent or yes or no, they can do it. You're actually saying, well, she can do it about 78% which to me doesn't follow like PLAR values in the educational system. It, it would be much more, make much more sense to just say yes or no. Uh, so I don't know how it works in your institutions, uh, but um, I find it very difficult to say that person is competent about 88%, you know, that's just a two cents on me. Um, so yeah, so uh, we talked about how they do this on the job every day. They wouldn't be competent if they weren't working, right? So there's a concept in RAC where failure is, isn't really there, right? We don't like to use the word failure in PLAR because they're doing it in their job. So clearly they're not fired. They're, they're capable of doing the job. They might have gaps, right? There might be uh, areas where they're not fully knowledgeable about everything in their job, right? They're not an expert of every, every competency. So they can be taught, they can do like gap filling is what we call it, little pieces that they're missing. Uh, but other than that, somebody to fail their assessment in PLAR would have to be extremely removed from the actual context of what they're doing in their job. So, it, I mean, of course it depends on the field. Some of you are gonna say, no, no, it's possible. And I was like, of course I understand it's possible. Uh, but a lot of the times, anyways, in Quebec, we try to, uh, fill those gaps so that there is no failure, so that it's just, um, oh, I have questions, but I'm not going to take them now. I'll take them when we get to the end, because if not, I'm going to be distracted. Um, um, yeah, I did mention rubrics. It's such an important topic. We'll talk about it later. How do we, so back to the assessment and the task, how do we do this? How are we going to evaluate that person who works? Um, and so we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Individualized approach, number two. Uh, main values in PLAR, really important. My favorite three words that I use over and over again is flexible, adaptable, and accessible, okay? This is you as an assessor. This is your assessments. This is the service that you're offering inside your institution and your approach. How are you doing your PLAR? These three words are key. We are working with adult learners. They have lives. They are not students. Um, group testing isn't really conducive to this, right? I mean, we, we're dealing with one person's you know, situation and everybody has different levels of situations and competency. Uh, you know, person A and person B didn't learn the same way or the same thing. So that needs to be taken into consideration, which makes it a lot longer to a lot of time you're spending and you're building relationship 
with this adult that you're bringing through the PLAR uh, approach. It takes a lot of understanding. Life gets in the way. They have families, they have work, they have you know, res other responsibilities. Um, in, in our case, we offer this through continuing education because we're talking about uh, adult learners and anything is possible, right? I mean, yeah, there is no, we can't do that. I mean, if COVID has taught us anything in the last almost two years is that we can do assessments online, anything is possible, not in person, uh, and uh, you can assess from anywhere in the world, right? And proof is we have lots of people from all over the place here today. Uh, so keep that in mind. If, if you're blocked, find another way. Find another way. Um, so the flexibility, the adaptability, and the accessibility of, of your service or your PLAR approach is key in your assessments. Okay. Very similar, one size does not fit all. Comes back a little bit to that, is this feasible? Um, does it make sense? Uh, are we doing it in the work context? You know, have to ask yourself all these questions. It's not like in a classroom, uh, in the sector where, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of like, um, what's the expression in English that you're, you're you know, mass, mass putting through evaluations and tons of students are coming through the course and it's just repetition. Far it's not like that at all. Um, you need to stay technical. You need to stay hands on. Um, and I really like, uh, some of you might have seen this, it's been around for a long time, and, but it's a, an important reminder uh, that it doesn't fit for everybody. Uh, education shouldn't be it's a, a one model approach and especially not PLAR. Uh, so this is a, one of my favorite reminders that I wanna keep with you. I, um, so I'm not gonna talk too much theoretically. I wanna do a case study. It is the best way for us to get a good idea. So I'd like to present to you, Susie. Now, uh, Susie is a daycare worker here in Quebec. Um, she doesn't have the title of daycare educator because she doesn't have the right certification. She's worked about five years here um, since she's moved in Canada. So she's got good work experience. Uh, and back in her country, she owned her own daycare. She had her own system and she had, you know, a home daycare. The government here in Quebec is looking to have qualified daycare workers, uh, ratio two to one. So there's this big movement of getting educators certified. Uh, Susie works 40 hours a week at the daycare. She's super busy. She's got two kids uh, and she's got no time to go back to school. So what are we going to do for Susie? What is she going to do? Of course, she's going to do some assessments through PAR. Um, so Susie's assessment, so she's going to take, uh, we call them competencies. So the eval we're evaluating competencies that are attached to learning outcome. And that's something I'll add to my slide because it's important because I, I hear you speak a lot about learning outcomes or objectives, and we call those competencies in a program, many competencies. Um, so she's going to apply to the early childhood education program. Um, and uh, here's an example of two of the competencies that she's going to need, that Susie's going to do. The first one is going to be, she has to demonstrate that she knows how to work uh, in a safe work environment, right? Does she have the skills to work in a safe work environment, okay, in a healthy environment? Uh, so that is an example of a, the technical name of the competency. A good example of what she can show us is that can she do hand washing? What's her hand washing? Does she, you know, do this and then the nails and, you know, that's part of her, you know, healthy work environment is that she has to do proper hand washing. So there is an assessment we could do for her to demonstrate to us. Uh, a second one, a little different, a little less uh, hands-on and technical, is she needs to design activities promoting overall child development. She needs to demonstrate that she can do this. Uh, in lamer terms, it would be, what is her programming? What does she put together as a plan, a pedagogical plan for uh, the children in her daycare, right? So these are two of the competencies we're gonna assess for Susie. 
Now, I have a bit of an interactive activity that I want you to participate in. No, so we're looking, like so please add, what is it that we can do to evaluate uh, Susie's hand washing and Susie's capability of building a, a pedagogical program for her? Yeah, so start, uh, yeah, uh, observe is a good one. I'm gonna go back and get my PowerPoint. Here we go. So you can see what we're doing. Where am I over here? Ah. Keep those coming in. What else could we do to help Susie uh, show us, demonstrate to us that she's competent, right? Is what we want to do. Um, okay, and then over here. Okay, so these are the two competencies uh, that we want Susie uh, to show us. And in the chat, let me just see how it's going here. Observation is key, right? Okay, so, ah, yes. How are we gonna observe if we can't go to the workplace, especially in a daycare right now? So we're gonna maybe film it. This is a great, great idea. Um, a hand washing poster, so you're right. Maybe Susie already has that. And she said, look at what I created. So part of, it's a little bit like a portfolio. She's gonna present stuff that she's done. Um, yeah, she can explain. Right. So that would be like a bit of an interview. She could just describe, you know, have a call with Susie and let Susie explain to you how she does it is a great, great way. Um, coming back to the portfolio idea, you know, Susie's pedagogical program plan, uh, she already she already has that. Right. She's probably last week uh, or last month presented to all the parents and the educators of the daycare, what the programming should be. Uh, you know, they're gonna pick carved pumpkins on Tuesday and they're gonna sing songs in the morning. And so she doesn't need to redo that. She does it in her job already. So we just asked Susie, hey, can you send me, you know, your planning for last week? Your, what was your programming? So these are, are great, easy ways to remember how to create assessments. Uh, there's a few more. A testimony is wonderful. Um, I'm just looking at all these. Yeah, all of them. And so I'll, I'll skip to my next slide, which has most of, I'm going to skip to my next slide in one second. There we go. So here are just some of them. You've named other ones as well. Um, and they are all good, right? And these are a lot of things that you wouldn't really do in the classroom with 40 students, right? Um, it could be a case study, like we just saw about Susie. It could be role playing. So you can, you know, have videos. You could make them watch a video of something happening. Uh, for example, an intervention between two children. Have a video an animation of two children fighting and then get Susie to react how she would intervene in this situation, right? Because uh, you can't necessarily have that uh, option. Um, the questionnaires, the, you know, uh, anyways, all of the other assignment, right? If she needs to write a report on something. Uh, what is key here is that you do not use standardized testing. There, and I do have the same Bloom's taxonomy uh, pyramid that Diane used in a few of my slides a little later. And we want to be really more at the top, the top four of the analyzing. And the, so, you're, you know, at the bottom is of that taxonomy knowledge pyramid is remembering. And is that really the way that you want to assess somebody who's competent in their work field is to just regurgitate on a questionnaire, uh, multiple choice. Um, so, you know, it's not, just doesn't, standardized testing, just, you know, multiple choice doesn't work in PLAR, important reminder. Um, so that was my little case study about Susie and there's lots of great things coming up on the chat. My next couple of slides are just guidelines. A lot of what uh, Diane covered uh, a little bit, uh, but so maybe uh, we can open it up and take some questions now, if you don't mind, because the case study really brought out like great ideas. So um, if anybody uh, wants to open their mic or add a chat, uh, a question in the chat, please do. Um, and we can, um, yeah. 
Good afternoon, Julie. Yes, hello. Hi, Timothy Howell here from Barbados. Nice. Oh, you're lucky it's warm where you are. <laughs> Very hot too. Um, you had said earlier that when you're measuring competency, somebody is either competent to player candidates. One may have five years experience and another may have two years experience. And this, and when you look at the evidence they bring, you may find that there is not there are knowledge gaps. And when you have when you have to decide on the level of competence, you realize that this person, his two years experience cannot compare with the person who has five years experience. Mm -hmm. But yet they are competent. But the competence is showing up in the years level experience. How then do you differentiate in assigning, a in, in deciding um, quotation marks, who is more competent than the other? Okay, so good question. You're right that um, experience will mean that certain people will have more experience than others. But at, at the bottom of the, at the end of the day, sorry, it's can they do it that competence, right? So maybe Marco uh, does it a lot better than John because, you know, John hasn't been doing this as long, um, but it doesn't matter. They're still doing the job and they're still both doing the competency, right? So we're not, we're not evaluating the level of competency, right? Is John better than, is John better than Marco or Marco better than John? Like, that's not really, however, of course, as an employer, uh, they want to make sure that they have top em competent employees, right? So in your PLAR model, in your assessment model, you can always do uh, what some people call top-up activities, right? So uh, give them a little gap filling, a little bit of, you know, um, bring them up to date maybe because their competency level is maybe a little outdated because they learned it 10 years ago. So they're going to need to be brought uh, up to date. So you can do uh, partial training in PLAR to help the people all get to the same competency level. Um, and just it, it's very great segue. I'll just show my next slide just because it's it's so conducive. Um, andragogy is the pedagogy for adults, right? And I love this diagram because in PLAR, we're all competent, right? It's not the teacher or the specialist or the practitioner uh, that's giving us the knowledge, right? Because the people that you're with, the individuals in the room are already knowledgeable. Um, however, and they might be more not knowledgeable than you. Like what if Marco has been working in the, in, the, in the firm for 25 years and you as the practitioner, you've only been there for about 10. Well, Marco's gonna know a lot more than you. And, and that's where we all collaborate and we share our, our, our knowledge together to all come out competent. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. I hope I answered your question. Um, you sure did. Great. So I haven't been checking the chat, so I don't know, Andrew, if there's anything specific that you wanna bring up. I have something, Julie, if I have, it's Diane. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, that was that was um, interesting, and really highlights the difference in approaches and process. <coughs> Excuse me. In this case, I think the easiest, um, how should I say, um, axis to make the separation between your approach and when I say my approach, of course, I mean Athabasca universities. Is, is based on the, uh, the philosophy and the, the prime purpose of these two, two types of institutions. Like at the college level, you're training people to do certain things and therefore this, the competency evaluation is really, really important. And when you mentioned the gap training, I was when, oh, so long ago, there was uh, a lot of literature that I was accessing about the notion of gap training, because that just fits for workers. It's the logical thing to do. And back in the day, I was sitting on a number of national councils, uh, 
that involved work and oh gosh, what's the word? That regulatory councils uh, on which we had um, Quebecois representation and across the country. And there was a lot of talk about, about this kind of training. And that's not mm -hmm. what we do at university because we're doing a different kind of thing. So uh, yeah. we, we wouldn't, for example, ask no. to plug in a hole. It's just, it just wasn't what we do. But one more thing I just want to say, mm -hmm. I just heard on the radio today that the federal government is finally going to allow practitioners from other countries with their credentials practice without having to obtain Canadian experience or a Canadian credential. We were lobbying for this, oh my gosh, I don't know how many years ago, 15, 20 years ago, we were trying to get this. This is one of the things that was always discussed at those regulatory meetings. Anyway, um, that's it for me. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's great. I didn't, I hadn't read that article. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm going to go back and look, but you do bring up a good point that in case of Quebec, uh, we have not reached uh, the level of being able to do PLAR in our universities yet. Uh, there's some advancement that's happening. There's talks, there's trial and error, but we're not quite there. So definitely a, a different approach when it comes to the two uh, institutions and the approach, yeah, thinking. Thank you, Diane. Julie, I think Melissa has a question. Wonderful. Please go ahead. Hi, Julie Eve. Um, I am from Holland College in Prince Edward Island, and we are just really starting to formalize what we feel is a new efficient PLAR process. Um, and I was happy to see Susie's case come up because early childhood is top of our agenda. Um, one thing we're trying to bounce around, and I'm wondering what your experience is in Quebec, is do we do course-based PLAR, which is the mm -hmm. outcomes, which are your competencies for each course, or do we do program-based PLAR where we focus on an entire program and fill in the gaps? So, so we're kind of like torn. We'd love to offer program. We just feel like that's a really ambitious place to start. Any suggestions on how we can tackle that? Very good question. So yes, that, that is tricky because it comes to the inner functionings of how PLAR is set up under your government structure, if I can say. Um, so if it's, if it's competency-based, maybe it doesn't need to be credit tied to a credit and tied to a course. So in our case in Quebec, the government wants people to be certified with a diploma, an accreditation that's academic, so there's credits to it and it's valid. Um, however, there are other approaches where you take a competency, we'll give you a certificate, and it could be more of an a la carte. What are you missing? Oh, you, you need these competencies to prove to your employer that you're competent? Well, then sign up to just these three assessments. Um, so it really depends on your institution a little bit and how they're going to be offering this because both both models are fine. You can co, you know, I mean, you can go with credits and, and courses, but let's just be clear when we say courses, you're not offering a full course, right? Because that's not PLAR. Because your, your individual who's got experience doesn't need to take a course. He just needs to take the exam at the end of the course, if we were to talk academically. He just needs to be evaluated. Uh, so we're, you know, it's not course-based, it's competency-based. I wonder if that makes, if that helps a little bit. I, I'm just gonna mention something real quick that I haven't put my email and, and Andrew, if you can pull that up and put it in there. I mean, I, like I said, could talk for hours about this. If you have other questions, please do, uh, you know, send me an email and uh, hopefully we'll have other chances to maybe exchange like this. I think we're running out, I don't know what time it is. We're, we're coming up on 1.30. So I'm, I'm just gonna step in here, but know there'll be some people able to stay on the line. So um, okay. I encourage if those of you who can and want to, um, we'll be able to keep the Zoom link open to have a further discussion. But I do wanna do just a bit of that formal piece to, to thank both Diane and Julie Eve um, for the information and for being so generous, generous with their time and insight today. 
um, Diane talking, you know, the PLAR primer and looking at micro and macro concepts was a really good way to start today. And Julie Eve coming in and talking more specifically about um, the tools and strategies and, and the case stuff, the case study was really um, effective to do. So it, it just helped anchor what we're talking about. And then as I monitor the chat, I'm reminded by the Schwetmick phrase, um, coming together to help one another. And another phrase that a colleague shared with me recently, she said, you know, alone we can go faster, but together we can go much further. And when you look at BC Plan's mission and, you know, a lot of us that have been pulled into prior learning assessment, I think that we've got such a gift and such an honor to work in the space and um, to learn from each other and to keep these conversations going is so important and vital to all of us. So I, I do think um, BC Plan will host more of these where we can do more discussions. And so thank you, Diane, Julie, uh, Andrew, the BC Plan Committee for coordinating all of this. It's been exceptional. And uh, yes, the recording will be possible as will the PowerPoints. Um, Andrew will take care of that. And those of you who are able to stay on the line, let's chat a little and, um, you know, mull over some of these thoughts and concepts. I know Diane had mentioned that she had something she wanted to share. So thank you, those of you who have to leave, thank you for joining us today. And those of you who are able to stay, uh, let's go into a general conversation and share some bits and pieces.